Hi, so for my project, I decided to do it on chondrichthys, which are the sharks, rays, and skates, when, or the cartilaginous fishes. Uh, I kind of decided on these because I realized I don't really know that much about them. And over this process, I learned a lot about what these uh, fish are and how they're different from the bony fish that make up so much of what we think of when we think of fish. So first of all, let's talk about the defining characteristics of a uh, of the contract these. So first of all, in their name, they don't have a bones uh, bone skeleton. They're made their skeletons are made of cartilage, which is like our ears and our noses. Uh, and what bone structures they do have, like their teeth or or bone structures they do have like the teeth or their vertebrae are actually just calcified, uh, calcified structures that give more support than cartilage can. They also have tooth-like scales uh, called denticles on their skin, uh, which kind of act like the same way scales, scales do on fish. Uh, and they're interesting because they're covered in enamel, uh, in, or an enamel-like substance called vitrodentine, which you can see uh, here on this top uh, thing here. You can see kind of how they're scales, but they're kind of more, uh, I guess, bony or tooth-like, which is where they get their name. Uh, denticles comes from the same Latin root as like dental does. Uh, and then, Lastly, they have specialized sensory organs on the skin that detect vibrations, temperatures, salinity, and pressure. These are um, uh, pretty important for a lot of what they do for detecting food and making sure that they're in the right environment. Um, and you can see this here on this Chimera anatomy. Actually, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you can see it has a lateral line along the middle of the body here and then around the eyes and around the face a little bit you can see those lines that make the that are the sensory skin cells that are sensory organs that are in those skin cells uh, that can detect these these things and then here you can see the calcified teeth when a lot of times when people find anything from fossilized sharks, it's almost always teeth. They can find the denticles and uh, they can find vertebrae, but the teeth are the part that gets, uh, that gets preserved the best just because it is calcified the way it is. And um, sharks especially will go through so many teeth in their lifetime. Certain species can just lose them and gain them like no problem. Next, let's talk about the phylogenetic tree. Here on the right here, we have the phylogenetic tree of all of the chordate phylum. Uh, so, and I've underlined in red all of the uh, determining features that I've mentioned in previous in the previous slides. So, you can see the the specialized sense organs organ organs um, came in about here right after the cephalochordata um, and that kind of each one of these has a different sense organ but in chondric these that presents itself as that lateral line um, and then here they've got the placoid scales which is just another term for the denticles. Uh, and then the cartilaginous skeleton right here. Uh, and that's pretty much what gives them their name. And then over here, I underlined in blue the bony skeleton. Uh, we see that right after the chondrichthys on the uh, on this phylogenetic tree. So um, all of these, all of the fish, amphibians, uh, 
reptiles, birds, and mammals will all have a bony skeleton, and that kind of separates them from the chondrichthys. And then over here on the left, I just put this one here because I wanted to show that the chimera out here are kind of an outgroup. They were something that really interested me when I was doing this project, just because I've heard of sharks and rays and skates, but I've never heard of uh, the chimera and kind of come to learn that the, the elas elasmo branches are the sharks and rays and skates. And then the holocephali are the, uh, the chimera, which are uh, pretty interesting. And we'll actually talk about them a little more here uh, right about now. So let's start with the chimera. Uh, this one here is the uh, long-nosed chimera. Uh, this picture was from a uh, NOAA dive on December 12th, 2017, uh, and they found this one. And actually, you can see the lateral line really well on this one right along here, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, but they separated from rays and sharks uh, 400 million years ago about, uh, and they're kind of, they've kind of been their own thing ever since. Uh, and they, I kind of like to consider them the outgroup of the chondriacthes. And then on the left here, we have the blue spotted ribbon tail ray, which uh, is a pretty neat uh, stingray that has two venomous spikes and it's um, different from the like chimera and the sharks because it's kind of that flat and disc shaped um, with the mouth and gills on the underside. Uh, so kind of they're different, differently structured. And then last we have this goblin shark here, which uh, I kind of had heard of before I started this, but I never really looked into them all that much. Uh, but I have this gif here of them eating a fish here, and it, it doesn't look that impressive, uh, but you can see that their mouth can open about 111 degrees, uh, and they use electrical sensors, those like same uh, sense organs that I was talking about. They have them underneath their little nose thing here, and they can sense they kind of swim around with their mouth open a little bit. And when they sense uh, prey right there in front of them, they open up and then grab it and bring it in. Um, and then this, uh, this GIF here seems pretty interesting, but it's not at full speed. So actually I have a GIF of it at full speed. Um, that's how fast they're doing this, which is pretty insanely fast. It's uh, about 3.1 meters per second, uh, which is, I think, the fastest strike in any of the chondrichthys, uh, which I thought was really interesting. And it's pretty amazing how fast they can open their mouths all the way up and come back down. So for their life cycle, uh, they birth their young in many different ways, kind of the whole spectrum. Uh, so the oviparous species lay eggs, which are kind of the, the traditional way of just kind of a pouch with an embryo and a yolk in it. Uh, and then there's the viviparous species uh, who give live births. So they'll, uh, they will just kind of give birth in, uh, to free swimming sharks when they're ready to be born. Uh, and then there's the ovoviviparous species, which are, I think are really interesting because they carry the eggs inside the mother. So it's kind of a combination of the both, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and then also they, outside of mating season, the sexes segregate, or in a lot of species, the sexes will segregate. Um, only to re reunite for mating season. 
uh, and this is to protect females uh, from the aggressive males. And a lot of times the males will stop eating during these time periods. Uh, other than this, they pretty much just go about their lives trying to find, um, find food and survive and then make it to the next mating season. Uh, and then they'll keep doing that until they die. Uh, so they actually have a pretty important ecological role uh, in many ecosystems. Uh, Chondrichthyes these are considered an apex predator. Uh, not all of them, but there are a few that are considered apex predators. Uh, and then even the non-apex predators uh, are still pr prolific predators of invertebrates like mollusks and crustaceans and also some fish. And this actually, uh, around 2004, we actually saw this happen with uh, the hammerhead shark as a keystone species. So there were, so this ecosystem where at the bottom, there were a lot of scallops and invertebrates. Um, and then the cow nose rays, who are a contract, uh, would eat those. And then the hammerhead sharks would eat the cow nose rays. So kind of, um, we've got that kind of scale here, uh, but the hammerhead sharks got overfished uh, and they, so their population plummeted, which uh, left no real predator of the cow nose ray. So the cow nose ray was just left to eat all of these scallops and all of these invertebrates. So it kind of um, had this issue where the cow nose ray population exploded while the predators and the prey on either side of them just collapsed uh, and it pretty much wrecked the ecosystem there. Uh, so this kind of shows how they, are part of a delicate balance of, uh, of a food web that these apex predators need to be there to keep the other, um, other predators in check um, so that we don't kind of over, overeat the uh, invertebrates. So I found this really interesting uh, uh, research project that I, I, I I never thought of it, but I guess they wanted to see, they kind of wanted to prove two things. They wanted to see how, uh, which type of shark tooth was the best at cutting. And then they wanted to show the, the how important it is to do modeling when you're doing testing. So they took all of these uh, teeth here. So there's, three main structures of teeth. There's the triangular pointed with small serrations. Uh, then there's the triangular pointed with large serrations. And then there's the elongate teeth with cusps. So this, uh, these top two here are the small serrations um, and that's the silky shark. And then this, uh, this middle one here is the tiger shark, which is the large serration. Um, and then this bottom one, they use the upper and lower jaws from, um, oh, I can't even remember what shark that's from now. Uh, anyways, it's a shark that is not really meant to do that. So, uh, but, and they have a different tooth structure. And they found that these triangular teeth cut better. So, the silky shark and the um, tiger shark cut better, and but they wore a lot faster. So uh, that kind of it's kind of a trade off where they're kind of meant to these sharks that have these um, do a lot of cutting. They cut it up before they eat it, but this third shark uh, needs more durable teeth and doesn't really need the cutting because they think that they swallow food whole, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but what really drew me to this project was kind of their method. They took sawzall blades and 
epoxied all of these uh, teeth on it, upper, like uh, all these teeth on it. And then they just turned on the sawzall and cut through a whole bunch of uh, tuna fillets, or uh, I guess tuna, uh, tuna bodies until they, and I did that a whole bunch of times. And that's how we get to this graph on top here where they were measuring the amount, the depth per serration or per reciprocation. So when the sawzall goes back and forth, they counted one, one was like all the way in back. And so they found that these uh, first two species, uh, this, uh, the silky shark had about uh, above a three, centimeter per reciprocation uh, average. And the uh, tiger shark was about a two and a half centimeter uh, cut per serration. Um, so both of those were pretty, were significantly higher than the other shark here that um, did not perform well. I think you can see that it was about half a centimeter per reciprocation. That's about all I have. I think this was overall a pretty interesting thing to learn about. And there's a lot that goes on with all of these uh, these species here. Um, and I learned a lot about what they uh, how they're different and what makes them unique. Thanks.